Welcome to Day 2, and I'm delighted to uh, have uh, Sheila Whitley of the Overseas Development Institute as our moderator for the first session. Take it away, Sheila. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming um, and for being here for the very first session of the day. Um, it should be a really interesting session and it's actually going to be slightly, I guess, more narrow in a way than the, the title suggests. Um, what we're going to be talking about this morning is really the question of assessing and managing risk in low carbon transitions. So what are the kind of tools that are available and what are the approaches that are being taken by governments, by companies, by investors to try to assess and manage these, these risks that are presented by, by the transition, particularly, obviously, um, those that are operating in, in fossil fuel production or that are investing and supporting um, fossil fuel production. Um, one of the, um, I guess, in terms of the relation to the work that we do at the Overseas Development Institute, a lot of our work in this space is focused on um, fossil fuel production subsidies. So the support that governments are providing um, to fossil fuel production through direct spending and tax breaks, through uh, public finance, and then also through um, supporting state-owned enterprises. And what we've found is that initially a lot of the I guess fight against fossil fuel subsidies has come a lot from civil society organizations, but more recently we had uh, three major insurance companies worth 1.3 trillion call for an end to fossil fuel subsidies. And I would say most interesting for this session, we had the Institute of Actuaries sign up to that statement. So actuaries are those that are primarily tasked with assessing risk, ma mainly for insurance companies, but also for, for major businesses. And they are now calling for an end to fossil fuel subsidies. So I think we have an increase in, um, I guess, awareness of the risks that this transition presents. How are we going to manage and, and how, how are we going to achieve an orderly transition to, to low carbon energy? And we're really, really fortunate to have two excellent speakers today, um, both of whom are looking at this, I guess, from their own, own institutions and companies' perspective, but also are involved in initiatives that are really looking at this um, at the global level and helping actors at the global level to, to navigate this transition. Uh, we're going to have the two speakers present one after the other, and then what we hope is that actually this session will allow us, because we only have two speakers, to have a little bit more time for interactive discussion to not just get questions from, from you, but also to hear your thoughts on what tools are available or what gaps are actually available in terms of data that's needed for assessing and, and managing um, and these risks. So first we have uh, Christoph McGlade. You will have heard of some of his research with Paul Eakins yesterday. He'll speak about that briefly, the research that they've been doing at UCL. But he'll mainly be speaking in his capacity um, with the International Energy Agency. He's working on the next World Energy Outlook and looking at the questions of stranded asset risks for that World Energy Outlook report, which is coming out, I think, on November the 16th, you said? Um, and so I welcome Christoph, and then um, I'll introduce Alistair after that, and then we can have a, an open discussion and questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, and um, yes, as, as Sheila mentioned, so I'll, I'm going to give a little bit of a brief background on some of the, the issues which were raised as part of the, uh, the Nature paper with which Paul talked about yesterday, but then mainly we'll, we'll use that to move on to the, the, the main subject of, of, of my talk, which is to look at um, if we are to transition towards uh, a two degrees future, what does that mean for the fossil fuel industry and what potential losses are there coming through? We often, we often heard a lot yesterday about the issue of stranded assets and the potential losses to the industry, but we wanted to look at what does he, what's the IAEA's thinking about this position and, and what are some of the potential numbers that, that could, could, there could be for the fossil fuel industry. So I'm sort of talking with two hats, hats here, and, and, and hopefully it'll be clear which I'm talking with at, at which time. So before going into the, into the, the, the real meat of the, of the talk, of the talk um, I think it's worth just trying to disentangle some of, the, some of the issues which are often conflated in discussing this issue and the losses that it could be to the in industry. So the, the, the Nature paper um, written with Paul was obviously very much focused on this, this idea of the leave it in the ground campaign. The, uh, the, there is a lot more fossil fuels out there that we can safely afford to burn if we want to stay um, on, uh, within two degrees. And that therefore means that there's a lot of these reserves that are unburnable. Um, but that's a quite a separate discussion, although it's obviously related in, in, in some ways to the, the work which is often uh, seen and been led by the Carbon, carbon Track Initiative on the carbon bubble. So this idea that there's going to be huge losses, potentially huge losses, to the fossil fuel industry, and that could, that could lead to, to widespread disruption throughout the, the, uh, the, the economy. But then separate to that also is the idea that there's, there's, there's potentially stranded assets out there. And so stranded assets, I'm defining here to be a much narrower sense 
which is capital investment which has been made, which you then don't, don't get your money back because of the introduction of climate policy. This is, this is steel or concrete that you've, you've, you've paid some money for, but as a result of climate policies, you can no longer um, get, get your money back which you spent on that. Um, so, so thinking a little bit just uh, initially about one of the issues that constantly came up whenever we were discussing the Nature paper, and that was this idea which Paul touched on yesterday, which is countries and, and companies often say that well, you, you know, it's all well and good you saying 80% of coal has to stay in the ground, but our reserves are, are, are burnable and we, we think there's, there's, there's no issue with, with using and utilising our stuff, it's everyone else that will have to stay in the ground. And this is, this is in many ways perfectly correct, um, but it's also quite disingenuous whenever you look at the numbers. So um, at the top there we have the 50% the, the, uh, chance for two degrees uh, budget from the IPCC, so around about 1,000 gigatons. And then below that, the, the, the emissions that would result from any of the different uh, fossil fuel reserves within different countries. So there are absolutely huge reserves of coal within the United States, for example, and if you were to burn all of the coal that exists in the United States, you'd, you would only reach 600 gigatons. So you would be perfectly possible of burning all the coal in, in the United States or burning all of the coal in, in China and so on and so forth, and you'd still be able to stay below the, with, or within the two degrees budget. Now, that's, that's one way of doing it. You, you, you could burn all of the coal in the United States, but that obviously leaves a very small amount of budget uh, available for everything else. And so whenever people talk about, um, well, our stuff is burnable, you, you, can, always, you can always say that that's, that's correct, but then what's going to be left in the ground as a result? Or what, what else has to, you know, where, where is the restraint elsewhere in the system as a result of you developing your stuff um, over, over somebody's, somebody else's? And the other thing that this, this leads on to um, is, is the idea that all of the fossil fuels are clearly very different. And talking about fossil fuels in a, in a holistic sense is, is perhaps also a little bit dis disingenuous. So, I mean, we can see, for example, for gas, the, the Middle East holds the, the largest gas reserves in the world. But, and if you were to burn all of those gas reserves, you, you, it's an awful lot lower than, than uh, uh, India's, uh, India's coal, for example. So... Um, gas is, is obviously in a very different position than coal and oil is also in a very different position as well given its, its, its use within the transport system. So one of the things we tried to do as part of the Nature paper was really differentiate between the fuels and say which do you really need to, 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 to push back on and, 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 and have more restraint on. But then coming on to this, this idea of, of what does it mean for, for losses of value and one of the other questions that we were constantly asked in this paper is what, what does all of this mean? What's, where, where's the loss to the system as a result of of having to leave a lot of this stuff in the ground. And um, I'm going to just talk briefly through two of the ways in which you could do this, although this first one I, d I certainly wouldn't recommend because I think it, it, it suffers from a, um, quite a few deficiencies. So whenever you look at the, the cumulative production that, it, that, it, that there is of, of fossil fuels out from, this is using the IA numbers from 2015 to 2040, how much coal oil and gas is used and then how much of the reserves are therefore not, not used and, and how much is unburnable or unusable within a two degree scenario. One way in which you can convert that into value is simply by saying, well, let's just take those, those volumes that are not used, multiply it by current market prices for, the, for these stuff. So, you know, take a, a price of $50 for oil, um, $4 per mm BTU for gas and so on and so forth and convert that all into a potential loss of, of, uh, of revenue streams to, to, to all of the, the fossil fuel industries. Now, this generates an absolutely huge number, so um, close to $100 trillion is, is greater than, than GDP, uh, global GDP last year. But it's not a particularly useful number um, that, that comes out of, of just this simple multiplication factors for, for, for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's, it's completely unclear whether any of these um, unburnable reserves would actually be used. Paul presented yesterday the differences between a two-degree scenario and a much higher degree scenario. If, this, if these reserves are not going to be used under a, a business-as-usual case or a, a case where you completely ignore climate change, can you really say that that's a, as a loss of value as a result of, of climate policy coming through? I would, I would argue you probably can't. Similarly, the, the idea that you can just multiply it by, by current prices is, is, is a bit... Uh, misleading because what prices will be in the future and when you actually produce the stuff in the future will obviously be very important. And similarly also what the costs will be for, uh, for this, uh, these oil, oil, gas and coal in the future is going to be very different from now. So this is one way in which you can try to, to give, get a first impression of the potential loss that there could be for the fossil fuel in industry as a result of climate policy. But I would say it's probably not the best approach that, that, that can be taken for, for looking at this. Another way of looking at this, and this relates more to the idea of the, the carbon bubble story, the idea that there will be a huge potential loss to fossil, the fossil fuel industry, is by looking at what, what happens to net revenue streams 
So here we have on the left-hand side historical net revenue, which is uh, the, the, the um, oil and gas prices. This is just for oil and gas. Oil and gas prices historically minus the cost of pr production on a global basis. So this doesn't take into account any transfer of rent between, uh, between uh, companies and countries. This is just taking, taking the full amount of net revenue there is. Obviously, we saw a, a very big drop in 2015 because of the drop in oil prices. And what happens under the, under the new policy scenario? This is the new policy scenario is our, uh, our central scenario, which takes into account the, the pledges that were made as part of the Paris Agreement, except the, uh, the uh, so taking into account the INDCs, but it doesn't take into account the, the two degrees um, limits that were also part of that. And what happens if you do then take into account the, the two degrees limit and you see that there's, uh, hopefully that's come out, have quite a large loss of, of revenue. So the net revenue that, that the, the fossil fuel industry, the oil and gas industry would receive uh, is a lot lower. So by 2040, this is about a trillion dollars lower that they would receive than under the, the new policy scenario. And so this is obviously a very important number and it's a, a very relevant number if you're, if you're worrying about potential loss of value. But I would still argue this is not really completely uh, this, the same as, as a stranded asset. Just because you, have, you haven't made as much money as you might have hoped you were going to make, that's not a stranded asset. That's, that's, a, that's a loss of, of value or a loss of revenue as a result of climate policy. And I think it's worthwhile keeping these two things quite, quite separate and, and, and discussing them in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different sense. But coming on to, to stranded assets themselves and, and, and our, our thinking on, on stranded assets and, and potential values here. So, as I said, it's the capital investments, it's the, the money that's already been spent or, or will be spent on capital investments, which you then don't recover as a result of climate policy. And again, it's important, I think, to differentiate between the different fuels that there are. So for coal, for example, um, whenever you look at our upstream coal, coal mines, there's actually the amount of capital which is invested into a mine whenever you open up a new mine is relatively small compared to some of the oil and gas um, upstream assets. So a coal mine around about a quarter of the total uh, investment which will be required into that mine over its lifetime will be in capital, the rest is in labour. Um, this is not the case for, for downstream assets and as a result of climate policy, the, the biggest potential loss that there could be because of capital which you will not recover because of climate policy is therefore likely to be in the downstream sector. So likely because of um, in, you, you bring in some climate policies in different countries and coal-fired plants which have either been built already or will be built in the future have to be shut down before they, they've recovered all of their, their, their full economic costs which went into them. I, sh I should have mentioned this, there's two potential ways in which stranded assets can come about. One is that you have to shut something down before it's, it's recovered all of its costs or the other is that you can keep producing, you keep running this, this uh, piece of kit um, till it's the end of its life, but as a result of, of drops in prices, you don't ever actually recover back your, your investments. And that, that second point is particularly important for, for oil and gas, because we saw with the, with the drop in oil prices, there were very, very, very few fields that were actually shut in as a result of prices dropping from, from well over $100 down to, to, to 30 or 40 at the lowest point. These things kept running because the, the price was still higher than their operating costs, but a lot of the capital that was, was put into those fields was written off. So these, it's, I think it's, it's both of these things can count as stranded assets. There's, there's obviously some crossover between the two, but, but for oil and gas, it's, it's particularly important to, 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 to reflect on both. But also for gas, um, it, I think it's, it's worthwhile saying that the, the, the biggest risks that there exist for, for natural gas are likely to be in the midstream, so the, 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 the transportation infrastructure that, that exists. So the reason for this is that in an upstream sense, gas is often seen as this transition fuel, and, and again, the Paul presented yesterday, you see that under a two degree scenario, quite often gas consumption is higher for a period of time under a two degree scenario than under a business as usual case. So actually the, the issues that there could be for upstream um, gas uh, infrastructure is potentially a lot less than, than for, for, for oil, given that you have this ramp up in, in consumption under, under most two degree scenarios. But that's not the case for, for a lot of the infrastructure that, that exists. So there, under a two degree scenario, you, you often hear this, there's obviously gonna be an awful lot more renewables out there. And one of the, the ways in which you require backup to renewables when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing is to have gas there. Um, and gas uh, to, to be able to come on stream very quickly to, to offset the losses. Now that, um, that means that you only need to have pipelines in place or LNG terminals in place so you can get that gas, gas to, to where it needs to be. But 
in a carbon constrained world, you're not going to be able to use that infrastructure to, to any large extent. So potentially you've built a, a, a very large pipeline which you're expecting to be used a, a large amount going forwards. But as a result of climate policies, these, this infrastructure can't be used. So that's not, this is not to say that there is no risks in the, in the downstream for gas or in the upstream for gas, but the biggest risks look like they, they lie in the, in the midstream for gas. And for oil, it's, it's, it's different again. So it looks like uh, upstream is, is where the potential biggest loss, losses could exist for, for, uh, for oil. And I'll come into that in, the, in, a, in a bit more detail on the, on the next slide. Um, but one of the things that we find under our, our modeling is that if, if the transition to two degrees is, is well signposted and policymakers are very clear and, and uh, uh, determined in, in their policy action and, and companies take good at attention of what the policymakers and direction they're pushing in, there's no huge need for there to be a massive amount of loss under, under any of the fossil fuels um, going forwards. There will be some coal power plants which will have to be shut down and we did a study in 2013 looking at the potential stranding of, of coal power plants and it, the, the numbers, there were around about 250 gigawatts of coal power plants which would have to be shut down before they'd recovered their full costs and that, that loss was around about 200 billion. So there will be some losses if under a two degrees transition, but the, our argument is certainly for, for oil and for gas is that there's, there's no intrinsic need for there to be a, a massive loss of, of uh, or a massive amount of stranded assets going forwards if the transition is, is well signposted. And the reason for that is because of, of the declines that you see in, in the field. So if we were to look at what happened in the new policies scenario, oil demand going forwards, we have, we have it rising from, from current levels up to around are just over uh, 100 million barrels per day by 2040. Under the 450 scenario, the two degree scenario, this the demand peaks much sooner than that and, and falls to around about 75 million barrels going forward. But if we look at what happens if we were to immediately stop now all investment into all oil, oil assets, and this is just oil I'm presenting here, we would see this very rapid drop off in, uh, in, in production going forward. So we often talk about this as a natural decline rate. If you stop in the absence of all capital investment going forwards into fields, roughly speaking, production will drop off globally at about 9% per year. Now, there, has obviously, there is obviously an awful lot of investment which is ongoing into, into fields and, and will continue to, go, to keep going into fields. Over the past few years, around about 60% of investment which goes into oil and gas uh, assets is into keeping production from these fields stable. And as a result of all of that uh, investment, we, we, we see the, the, the observed decline. So there is a much lower level of uh, drop off. It's around about uh, four to six percent um, de decline from currently producing assets. But we can still see this, this big difference between the observed decline and what happens under the 450 scenario. And that means that you therefore require new investments to come online each year. That if you don't have these new investments coming online, you're going to have a real issue because it's going to, very, very quickly you're going to see a big gap between where you want demand to be in the 450 scenario and what, where your, your current production is. So you need to have this continual investment into new assets going, going forwards for oil. And as a result of this, that actually means that the, the potential for stranded assets in upstream oil is somewhat limited. Um, and probably slightly surprisingly some more limited because the amount of investment that required is actually quite large. So under the, the 450 scenario, we estimate that around about $7 trillion is required between now and 2040 to, to ensure that this, this declining oil uh, tra trajectory is still ma ma matched by, by new supply sources coming online. Under the new policy scenario, there's, there's obviously a much higher level of investment that, that is required. You require about $11 trillion to be invested between now and then. And, but, it's, I mean, that's a $4 trillion difference between, between the two scenarios, but $7 trillion is still obviously a large amount of money. And I've mentioned uh, that there is there's no need for, for some assets to, to come about, but that doesn't mean that, there, that that won't happen. And there's two real big areas of risk where we can see that, that you could have a, a much higher level of stranded assets going forwards than would happen under, what, under these idealized scenarios. The first of it is an inconsistent policy making or if policy makers are not clear about what they're, they're, they're going to do. And you could argue that we're actually currently in that situation where you have a Paris Agreement saying well below two or one and a half degrees and the INDC is giving you a, a huge gap. I mean, the, the, the gap shown here is essentially the gap between those two levels of investment that are required. So, if policymakers in, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years decide to ratchet this, uh, this up, there's a potential that there could be a higher level of, of, of uh, stranded assets than there would otherwise need to be if they were much clearer and put in place the policies that are required to, to, to lead us towards the, the 450 scenario.
The other way that is there could be a high level of stranded assets going forwards is if climate, uh, oh, sorry, if fossil fuel companies misread what the, the, the direction of policy. If, if companies start to invest on, the, say, the, the new policy scenario trend, but suddenly find that, that we're actually moving along the, the 450 scenario line. So if they, if they invest, um, keep investing, thinking that demand is going to keep on rising, but actually find that demand has peaked and, and, has, and has come down, there's obviously a, there's a much bigger potential there that some of their, the assets they've invested in won't be required and, and they'll, they'll incur losses as, as a result. But I mean, it's also important to recognise here that uh, this 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 four trillion dollar uh, difference between the 450 scenario and the new policy scenario is very unlikely to be realised as a as a stranded asset. You could you could see that if fossil fuel companies completely misread uh, the 450 scenario and said, no, we think we're along the new policy scenario, but they actually find out that the world's on 450 scenario going forward up to 2040. Yes, there could be four trillion dollars worth of stranded assets that that result, but. That would require fossil fuel companies to keep investing despite the fact that they can see that there is, the demand is a lot lower than they think it would be. And so to, to have this very large number of $4 trillion of stranded assets really requires you to, to think that fossil fuel companies are going to act in a very irrational way going forwards, that they're going to keep investing despite the demand for the product not, not being there. Um, so I'm going to, going to finish there to leave us plenty of time to, 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 to talk um, and discuss this in further detail, but just to give a few uh, high-level conclusions. So, I mentioned at the start the, the real importance of, of differentiating between the different fossil fuels when talking about the risks to the fossil fuel industry as a result, result of climate policy, and also, also differentiating between the different types of loss that can be, that can be incurred from assets which can't, with reserves in the ground which can't be produced as a result of climate policy to potential loss of value going forwards and value which won't be realised because of climate policy to actual investments which are made which are not recovered as a result. As I say, because of the, the demand uh, trajectory under the 450 scenario, it drops at a maximum of about 1 million barrels per day um, at about 1, one to 1.5%. One, to one that rate of decline in demand is a lot lower than the rate of decline we see in an observed de decline from, from existing fields. And as a result of that, we still require investments to keep on going to ensure that there's a smooth transition. It's, it was mentioned yesterday that uh, there's, there's always some argument of whether oil, high oil prices or low oil prices are, are good for the, uh, for the climate agenda. Last year we looked at a, a low oil price scenario to, to investigate this to some extent and found that low oil prices are, are good in some respect because they give policymakers space to introduce, uh, to, to reform fossil fuel subsidies for example or to introduce carbon taxes etc. Um, but it's bad from, uh, on, on the whole it's bad if these policies don't change because the efficiency uh, measures which would be put in place under high, high oil price scenarios don't get made and as a result of the, the lower prices it's, policy has to ramp up to ensure a similar level of, of emissions reduction going forwards. So generally speaking low oil prices are not good for the environment and, high, and, and uh, higher oil prices are, are slightly better but the worst of all worlds is to have a volatile price going forwards and if you don't have sufficient investment coming forwards even under a 450 scenario you're unlikely to end up in a, in a situation where, where oil prices are quite volatile and that's not going to be, be helpful at all. As I mentioned though the risk of stranded assets uh, arises much more if there is inconsistent policy making or unclear policy making or if uh, fossil fuel companies misread what the direction of travel is for, for oil demand. But saying that, just to, just to conclude, that uh, it's obviously clear that the, the climate change and climate change policy represents a real fundamental shift for, for the fossil fuel industry. And all of the fossil fuel companies need to be ready to justify the investments they make and stress test their portfolios against a, a two degree scenario to ensure that we're, we're, in, we're going in the right direction looking forwards. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. So just quickly, in the interest of time, um, I'll hand over now to Alistair Hamblin. Alistair is the Strategic Marketing Director for GE Oil & Gas. Uh, GE is a major service and equipment provider to uh, the energy sector as a whole. And Alistair is going to be speaking both about this question of um, assessing and managing risks, both from GE's perspective, but also um, based on some work that is being done by the Energy Transitions Commission, which is a parallel commission to the new climate economy. Thanks, right. Alistair. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm afraid I, I missed yesterday's session. Um, as I was saying to Michael, uh, it's always the people who are closest, because I'm based in London, in fact, West London. It's always the people who are closest to, uh, who don't make it. But um, I hear you had some sort of very good discussions, and 
What I'd like to do is talk about the way that GE, GE Oil and Gas, sees investment decisions. Um, actually pick up on a number of things that Christoph said, so I'll try not to, to sort of duplicate. Um, really, I suppose my day job is planning strategy. We call it marketing, but it's basically strategy for our business that provides technology and services to the oil and gas industry. So we think a lot, and I think a lot about where the industry is going, where investments will be made. We think about what might be stranded assets for us if we invest in facilities that then don't get used. But obviously to do that, we need to think about, well, what are our customers going to be doing? How are they going to be making investment decisions? So you're talking so second or in some case third order questions of investment. But I'm, I'm also here as part of GE. And GE as a company obviously spans the entire energy space. Um, virtually every form of power generation, uh, midstream, and a lot of energy intensive uses. So as GE, we think about this a lot. Um, and then thirdly, um, as you said in the introduction, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Energy Transitions Commission, which is a, a kind of cross-industry group, a very diverse group, which we think is quite interesting in terms of framing um, some of the, the ways that people can start to move towards common planning assumptions, which I think will help with, with the, some of the things that Christoph just talked about. So in terms of, is it the right, right one? Yeah. yeah. So just a word about GE. Um, Obviously, something's gone slightly strange with the format as the slides come through. But um, just give you a grounding, because this will, I think, frame a little bit about how I think about this as part of GE. Um, you know, we've got this very broad industrial portfolio. About half of the business is directly concerned with energy production and, and transmission distribution. So oil and gas, power, renewables, energy connections, and so on. Um, and then a lot of the rest is, is to do with very energy intensive businesses, um, transport, aviation, obviously. So it's kind of critical for us. Um, and as we think about the way that the energy system is going and the transition that's coming, we try to, try to take an end-to-end -end view and we, we're explicitly diversified. And we're diversified because we recognize that there are huge uncertainties about technology and policy. And that's a very deliberate decision, we, we talk about that. And I think that's important when we come back to think about how the industry as a whole um, will frame this. Because there are certain things today about technology evolution, down cost curves and so on, which are unknown, and in many ways probably unknowable. So we need to have a policy of initiative, you know, a portfolio of initiatives, we need, need to place some bets, but we also try to, need to try to narrow down that environment so people can make investment decisions within a certain boundary of what they think is gonna happen. Now, talking a little bit about the Energy Transitions Commission, GE is involved in a number of cross-industry groups, and this is one that I'm, I'm personally involved in. Because we believe that this is not something that any one organization can solve on their own. And the, the ETC is set up deliberately with a diverse group of commissioners from different backgrounds. You'll see there are industrial companies spanning you know, fossil fuel production, technology, um, transmission, distribution, uh, retail. There are research agencies, there are you know, policy groups, etc. And we brought that group of people together in the full knowledge that there will be strong tensions in the group. There are people coming at it with very different agendas, different perspectives, but also believing that if we can get that group to think about um, ways that we can move from the what to the how. You know, what practical steps can policymakers, can companies take uh, to, to move forward? That will be helpful because if we can get some consensus in that group, then it should actually be something we can take out to, to the world. Now, we're in the middle of work on stuff, so I, I, you know, I can't tell you exactly the recommendations that will be coming out, but I can give you a preview, I think, of some of the discussions we've been having um, and some of the emerging findings from the working groups, which I, which I hope will be useful. But one important point about the ETC is that the kind of grounding principle is that we believe that an energy transition and economic and welfare development are interdependent. They're, they're not contradictory, they're complementary, and in fact you can't have one without the other. Because if you don't have an energy transition, you will not get economic development because of the, the problems that will result. And if you do not have a strong economy, if you do not have welfare, and if you do not have public support, 
you will not be able to fund the investments and make the policy decisions required for the transition. So that, these are the kind of principles that we laid out when we started this thing about a year ago. Now, in terms of the kind of emerging views coming out, um, first off, there's a natural tension, I guess, as you'd expect, between what I'll describe as the should and the could, between ambition and realism. And I think they're both important, and I'm sure that you talked a bit about this yesterday. You need the ambition to drive people to make a difference, and you need people to have the call to action. Then you have the people in the room from companies like RWE um, or Statnet saying, great, now I'm charged with delivering power to consumers and to, to industry, and I can't wish for things, I have to make them happen in reality. So, you know, that tension is important, and I think we just reckon, we must recognize it in groupings like this, in, in groupings like the ETC, we recognize it, we recognize they're both legitimate. And then we'd say, right, how do we channel both of them together to make some um, choices and to inform policymakers? The second emerging conclusion is that um, the, the group on, on energy flexibility is, is coming out with a view that power systems can absorb extremely high levels of intermittent renewables which I think is something that is quite interesting, and we're doing a lot of work to make sure the analysis on this is bulletproof. But if that's you know, true and we can quantify it, that does change, I think, the public debate a bit, because a lot of debate has been, um, you, know, you can only have a certain amount of intermittent renewals in the system, the, the investment required to get the grids to be ready is enormous, therefore we can't do it. And the, the, the view from that group is no, we can actually push it a lot further. The third view, which I think certainly we as GE support, is that electrification, is, is very important, even in advance of decarbonizing the power mix, because of the flexibility it creates. Right? It, separate, it, it breaks this apparently insoluble problem into two parts, and even if you accept that in countries like the UK, if you electrified everything today, you might actually get an increase in, in coal-fired power gen in the short term, um, it allows you to separate the front end to the back end. And then lastly, um, the view of best uses of fossil fuels. So the idea that long distance heavy duty transportation requires energy density. And it's very difficult to move away from fossil fuels in the near term. Um, I mean, my colleagues in aviation are working on full elect you know, fully electric propelled airplanes. But I think that's going to take a while. And same for long distance trucking and so on. Um, similarly, you know, coke and coal. So if we can focus uses on those things, then I think it you know, helps advance the, the, the agenda. So given all of that, what, what do we think as GE and as GE Oil and Gas? I'm not going to make any f specific forecasts because if living through the oil and gas cycle for the last two years has taught me anything, it's taught me that people, most people are very bad at forecasting these things. Um, but our working assumption is that policymakers and consumers will send the demand signals to lead to a, a decline in fossil fuel consumption. And I think it's fundamental that we think about the demand to do that, because the supply side, the oil and gas companies, will invest to meet expected demand. And so we've got to give them some guidance on what they think demand will be so they can make the right investment decisions. As Christoph said, they're, they're going to behave like rational actors, I think, largely. And the reason I say it's about demand and expectations of demand is that you know, they're, they're, going to, they're going to invest to meet what the barrels they think are required. And if the disinvest movement, for example, succeeded in persuading BP or Shell not to do that, then Rosneft or Saudi Aramco or some little independent company based in Oklahoma City will do that. And, and so, the, you know, from a system point of view, it doesn't actually make any difference. Whereas if the entire in industry can manage towards a certain expectation, and there's a degree of consensus on what that might be, then I think that gets us in the, in the right direction. But under any reasonable scenario, I think oil and gas will remain a big part of the energy mix for a long time. Um, as Christoph said, that requires a lot of ongoing investment um, because of the decline rates. If you think that, you know, if you say three to four million barrels a day of production of oil are coming out of the, the production system every year because of decline, so if you're running at a roughly 1% increase, which we have been um, over the last few years on average, 
you're adding net one, but gross you're adding four. So three quarters of that, thereabouts, is simply to the whole production flat. So we make some similar assumptions, um, you know, slightly different time frame, but we estimate seven trillion dollars um, in sort of upstream, midstream oil and gas so between now and 2030 of investment. Um, you're adding somewhere in the region of 70 million barrels a day of new barrels after, after the observed decline. Um, that's a lot of investment, and a lot of that is required just to, to hold the industry still. For us, as a technology provider, that's investment our customers are having to make, and we will you know, invest, we will develop the technology, the products, uh, and the facilities to support that. Now, the treadmill of decline rates, I think, is important, and I won't you know, repeat what Christoph said, but a couple of thoughts. You know, one, shale can help here. Um, shale's had a you know, very bad press in some ways in terms of its impact on total carbon emissions, um, in terms of uh, adding a lot of, of reserves. But if you're talking about a resource with a first year decline rate in excess of 40%, and an entire kind of across the, the piece decline rate of 20 plus percent, that's an extremely fast depleting asset. And so that helps minimize the, um, the risk of, of stranded assets in, in the sense that Christoph said of invest capital investment, which does not return its, um, its cost of capital over the life of the asset. The second big source of supply is likely to be kind of core OPEC. And again, though, you know, very large fields, which require relatively limited investment to keep producing, again, they're not likely to produce massive stranded assets. The third source, which is more problematic, is offshore, and particularly deep water offshore. Now, those also have high decline rates, but they are extremely capital intensive, and typically they're planning for a you know, multi-decade um, investment horizon. So that's where I see more of a risk from our customer's point of view of assets that, that may become stranded. And you talked a bit, Christoph, about um, midstream infrastructure, um, particularly gas. And you know, our working assumption is that gas will keep going for longer um, and maybe a complement to intermittent renewables. It does depend on the scenario. Clearly, it depends on, in particular, what we do with coal. The interesting thing about many of those midstream investments is where the investment risk lies. So traditionally, um, LNG liquefaction plants, I mean, huge capital intensive plants, uh, the, the recent ones in Australia were truly extraordinary in terms of cost per tonne, sort of $2,000 per tonne of capacity, which is out of line and we don't think that's sustainable. But even if you come back to the long-term average of somewhere in the region of $800 to $1,000 per tonne of capacity, um, it's a very big capital asset with a, a multi-decade life. Traditionally, those things have been sold ahead, and they won't get the final investment decision until they've got 80-plus you know, percent of production locked in. The recent US ones have moved to more of a, um, a model, a merchant model, but they've got take-or-pay contracts. So in a sense, they've shifted the risk onto the downstream user, in most cases the utility. So I don't expect many of those projects will go ahead unless they've got contracts locked in. Um, we're in a, a bit of a lull at the moment because the, the industry is oversupplied till the mid-2020s. We're expecting it to come back. And, and I think your point, Christoph, about the, the risk there is, is right, but the risk will actually sit probably with the utilities who've got those contracts. And then lastly, from an investment perspective for us, we expect technology intensity to keep going up. Um, now, that's partly to do with the assets you're developing. It's partly to do with the policy environment, particularly things like integrity, um, flare gas reduction. The Norwegian uh, government, for example, has been particularly strong in, in mandating integrity management for subsea fields in the Norwegian sector. And that means more inspection technology, it means more monitoring technology, more, more digital. So the technology intensity of the industry may go up even as, in a kind of life cycle view, it starts coming to its plateau and then, and then decline phase. Now, for us, that's important. But I think also for oil and gas companies, it's important because it means they need to keep evolving their technology, which, which takes me to the, my last point, which is redeployment. So I expect if we're here in 10 years' time, that kind of long term that we're talking about will feel a lot closer. And people will probably have started to modify their behaviors a lot more than they have today. But what I expect is that they will have started to apply their core capabilities, technologies to new things. So just to give you a couple of examples from our business, um, 
we apply technologies we've developed for oil and gas to other things. We apply, for example, core rotating equipment, compression technology that we develop for pipeline compression, for LNG, liquefaction, to things like compressed air energy storage or liquid air energy storage. Now, you can take your own view on the merits of those versus you know, large-scale batteries, etc. but they're all part of a portfolio of technologies for large-scale grid storage. And similarly, we've taken um, technology, kind of organic cycle um, waste heat recovery technology that we developed for combined cycle power plants, and we've put that into thermal renewable sources, be that biomass or, um, or geothermal. So you're reapplying. Similarly, pipeline, you know, if we need to develop very large CO2 mass transport, that's very similar to pipeline networks. Um, and digital technology, I think, will, will apply across the board. So to close, I think we as a company see the challenges. We also see the opportunities. We think that technology and technology investment will be, will be critical. And to do that and to minimize the risks of people investing in the wrong things, I would just echo what Christoph said, which is firm and clear policy direction that gives companies a planning horizon and, to, and where possible a reasonably consistent planning horizon for all of them is the best chance of avoiding asset losses, which however, whatever our views on fossil fuels are, will hit us all in our pension pots at the end of the day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alistair. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes um, for questions and comments, so maybe we can do a round of four and four, depending on how much time we have. Um, there are, can we start kind of going from the bottom across? Oh, the, the hands have popped up. So we'll start here with Paul, and then Pete, and then Mark, and then the gentleman in the blue jumper. Yeah, thanks very much. Paul Eakins from UCL. Two really thoughtful and interesting presentations. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like just to ask two things. To link with the discussion last night that we had about compensation, fascinated Christoph by your graph showing the um, outcome of the fossil fuel price drop in 2015. Um, <clears throat> that was obviously a market phenomenon. Uh, lots of both rich and poor countries lost a lot of money due to that market outcome. I've not heard anyone talk about the need for compensation. That was recognised to be a market risk and people had to lump it. Uh, climate change clearly is something that uh, we've been expecting for quite some time because the science has been showing it since the 70s but has not been a public issue uh, for that long. And I'm just wondering why there is the notion that market risks uh, fall to market participants, but when there's an overwhelming need for public policy and the public policy uh, action needs to be taken, people start talking about compensation in that way. The second point I'd like to make um, really is, is to ask about, um, uh, we, we've heard the need for consistent public policy and the need for companies to take account of that. But of course, these two things are linked. Uh, they are endogenous. We know that Exxon Mobil has known about the climate change issue since the 1970s. It has spent billions of dollars since then uh, obfuscating, confusing the public, uh, spreading misinformation in order precisely to stop the consistent public policy that would have been necessary and that would have been much easier to solve the problem had we taken action back then. So we've got this endogenous issue with the companies not behaving as policy takers but the companies behaving as policy influencers and policy makers through their lobbying networks and, and I'd, I'd be very interested just in your observations on that from inside the industry where you must, uh, these must be your clients, these guys, um, and also from the IEA, given that intergovernmental body, uh, it's um, interested in government policy, but obviously its links with the industry uh, are very great. Great, thank you, Paul. You can pass it back to Peter Erickson right there. Hi, Pete Erickson with Stockholm Environment Institute. My question was similar um, to Professor Eakins' second question, but I'd like to add on, it's not just that industry is, a, um, it's not necessarily true that it's a taker of policy, but it's not a taker of demand in a sense either, because as markets can get oversupplied, as you've noted, 
you know, can that not affect price and overall consumption in a way where demand is not purely given to them? And so, you know, in, in that world, is there a role for limits or other business centers to supply? Great, if you pass it along, if you pass it along to me. Hi, I'm Mark Fulton, Carbon Tracker. So Christoph, um, thanks very much. I thought it was a great exposition of the stranded asset um, issue, and I have to say it's much in line with Carbon Tracker's views, so that's great. Um, but the one thing that uh, I, I will say, you said keep disaggregating. Well, you did aggregate your final comment that we need more investment in fossil fuels <coughs> to meet decline rates. We agree on oil and gas, but not on coal. Using your carbon budget and Wood McKenzie's database, we don't need any new coal mines, we don't think. So I'd be interested in your comments on that. And then finally, CCS. Um, you know, as CCS fails to scale up, are you going to start adjusting your carbon budgets? Mark, if you actually pass it two rows back and put it um, Thank you. Uh, Roman Menelevich from German Institute for Economic Research. Um, my question is, um, seeing uh, in Germany, for example, the split of RWE and observing that for a long time in one company that had, it, uh, there has been two developments going on. One is renewables and trying to push for newer technologies and one is an old business model with um, um, yeah, earning money from uh, coal power plants. So my question is, um, what, from a company's point of view, how do you see um, it's being solved inside of the companies that I think is an issue, not just with RWE, but also with GE and others? Great, thank you so much for those questions. So perhaps both of you could just take them in turn. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, Christopher, Alistair. Great, well, very good set of questions. Um, Paul, take yours first. On the, um, on the compensation question, look, I mean, it's a, it's a very complicated question. Obviously, the, it's where you hit the boundaries of, kind of economics, ethics, and so on. I, I think that the difference I would draw, this is not GE policy, by the way, this is me thinking on this, and we have a lot of discussions on this in the ETC. I'd say the difference between market dynamics and policy mandated shift is that the market, you say, this happens, no one controls it. I mean, I think what the last cycle has shown is that even OPEC didn't really control it. Um, we can debate that. Um, whereas if you, if you have a mandated policy shift and you recognize that high oil prices are not helpful for that policy shift because they would act as an investment signal, then you have to have a policy shift away from fossil fuels whilst keeping prices down. And those two things will be in tension with each other if you are a, a producer with not much apart from upstream assets. So therefore, I think you could have a legitimate point of view that say, well, how does that work? You know, if you want me to support this, then is there some kind of transfer involved? I, I think that's how I frame it now. G is not involved in that debate. It's, it's not something we have an official policy on. But I think as part of the ETC, we've discussed that and, and also discussed in the current environment of um, what should we call it, the kind of legitimization of disaffection with globalization, etc., as shown by the Brexit vote, as, as shown by the politics in the US, you have to be incredibly careful how you broach that subject um, in, in, in both sides of the debate, because in the, on the, on the resource rich country side, there's a question of um, equity. But I think on the, the developed country side, there could be a huge public reaction if you said, well, we're going to go down that route. So I think it, it needs to be handled incredibly carefully. Um, on, on your question of policy and lobbying, look, I mean, it's, it's clear that the, the oil and gas majors have very different positions on this. Um, the European com companies in general, I think, are more supportive. Um, Total has taken a big step, I think, by buying SAFT um, and starting to invest very heavily in, in battery technology. Uh, BP obviously went down a route a number of years ago and then kind of came back again. Um, what I would say is that they, you know, in our interactions with them, you know, clearly they are 
profit maximizing companies, as you'd expect. They are looking to invest to generate a return. Um, and that's why I would see the policy signals to give them a view on future demand as, as very important. Remember that their return on investor capital halved at the time of the oil price was $110. Um, so they're under enormous pressure from their shareholders only to invest in things that um, they're going to return uh, you know, shareholder value over the long term. And it's not clear that more mega projects is the right way of doing that. Um, so if they can have a view on where the industry is going, what demand is going to be in the future, what's going to come out of their lower cost competitors in places like the Middle East or potentially you know, Russia, when largely, with the exception of shale, they're focused on more um, fringe plays and deep water and so on. I think that's the best way of, of focusing their investments in the right place. Um, I think they will increasingly have to accept the direction of public policy. Um, that's not good. Um, I don't know, Chris, you know, before we move on to the other questions, do you want to? No, I'll, I'll address the next two questions um, to in the interest of time. So we, one of them was on, is there any reason for limits to, to supply um, the question from, from, from over there? Um, I think it, it, it very much depends on, on your views as to where that should be happening and also the mechanism that you think it would, would be able to be brought about. The, as, I, as I mentioned during the talk, I mean, it's important not to choke off all investment and choke off all supply because you're only going to get in a, a real energy security issue and a potentially price volatile situation, which I don't think will be helpful for, for, for any transition uh, looking forward. So um, the, I think there are, as I mentioned, the, the biggest risks that, that there potentially are on the oil side of things is for, for long-lived um, uh, very capital intensive projects and I think it's up to individual companies whether they want to take on that risk um, involved given what might happen with climate policy going forward. Whether uh, policymakers themselves are going to be able to choke off um, supplies is, is a much more open question. We, we've seen in the UK, for example, you have a complete disconnect uh, between wanting to maximise the revenue of the, North, of the North Sea and at the same time also not wanting to uh, for other countries to develop their resources given that uh, it will lead to catastrophic climate change. So um, I think it's, 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 it's a bit simplistic to say we can, we can just uh, cut off supply, but I think it's for, probably for the companies to make that decision. On, on whether new coal mines are required, um, I don't think they're necessarily required, but the, almost at least some new coal mines will, would be open still under a 450 scenario, simply because they'll probably be cheaper than existing coal mines, and some coal mines after a certain period of time start to get quite expensive and require and reinvestment in some of the, the infrastructure required for them, and so new coal mines might be um, quite, but obviously the, the amount of coal, and you're absolutely right to correct me to say that um, what I was talking about in terms of new investment required is mainly on the oil and gas side, we have this natural decline, this observed decline, and it's very different for, for, for coal. Um, as CCS scales up, um, you asked whether we will adjust our CO2 budgets. I mean, uh, um, CO2 budgets are independent of, of your amount of CCS. Um, you have the, uh, they're, they're a hard and fast limit, and if you if you have CCS at that high, you slightly more space to, to emit slightly more, uh, produce slightly more uh, fossil fuels, just with a, uh, a much lower level of, of emissions coming out of it. And certainly, we have CCS within our modelling. Um, this year, in, within year 2016, we will likely be um, pulling back slightly on, on CCS um, compared to where we've been in, in the past, simply because the, the moves in the, in the real world haven't been matching the, the aspirations that there have been on, on CCS. So we'll be, we'll be pulling back slightly on, on CCS, but, but it doesn't, that doesn't really affect the, the no, CO2 budgets. That's the wrong question. I'm just that you're pulling back your assets. Um, I think the last question is... Yeah, I'll come to the last question. But actually, just on, on CCS, I mean, I think, what, again, one of the discussions we've had in the ETC is that CCS is one of the really big unknowns here. Um, and it's yet to be proven whether it can be viable at scale, economically. And it's really important, again, back to this question of setting up a policy environment. It's important that we know as quickly as possible whether it's going to be viable. So, you know, so we as GE were quite disappointed when White Rose was cancelled last year. Um, I think if we can get some pilot projects that prove this or show that it's not going to work, then 
can, we can lock in in the IEA and others can adjust their scenarios. Um, in terms of the, the question about the tensions within companies, um, look, I mean, I think that's, it's clear. Um, within utilities, it's, it's been there for a long time when you say, well, there are companies that are paid here in terms of volume, but you're also asking them to reduce volume, you know, how does that work? I think, you know, a number of different models on the, on the utility side, I mean, sometimes it's, it's a question of splitting the company, splitting out the renewables, assets, or whatever, I mean, they're different, different companies are taking different points of view. Um, I can certainly talk to GE. Uh, within GE, we have the full range, and, you know, we've, we've got people working on nuclear, we've got people optimizing thermal coal plants, gas plants, we've got an entire business around uh, renewables, specifically offshore wind and, and um, hydro which is bolstered with our acquisition of Alstom. And the way we think about this is meet demand, right? The best technology to meet demand. We're not going to determine whether a customer decides to invest in a new coal plant. That's going to be a decision they make based on the economics of their situation and the policy of their, of their region. If they're going to put in a coal plant, I would far rather they put in a very, very modern, very efficient, very clean coal plant than one that is not, um, given that we're not going to influence that decision. Um, over time, I would expect that the bits of our business that deal with fossil will come down, and the bits that renewable will, will go up. But big as GE is, and critical as it is to the, um, you know, the power generation distribution networks around the world, we can't influence that. The most we can do is advance the technologies as fast as we can in new areas and areas where the technologies are currently not yet proven at scale or at high cost. And I, I would actually relate that back um, to the earlier question about are fossil fuel companies take us to demand? I think they are, really. I mean, no one company can, you know, can influence demand. I mean, yes, Aramco and the other core OPEC companies can have an impact on price, which has you know, and, and demand has been shown to be more elastic to price over the last few years, and I think that many people expect it. But certainly if you talk about the publicly traded companies, um, they're too small. However big they are, their share of the global market is too small for them, for them to be able to have a material effect on, on the price. So I think they are acting as demand takers, uh, price takers, um, and Therefore, their investment decisions will be based on you know, their expectations of whether that demand and price will be in, in 20 years' time. Great. I think we have time for another round. Um, so if we... Oh, sorry, Laura, we're going to go up because we started the bottom before. So first, um, Doug, and then Steve, and then Dennis, and then Franz, if I'm getting that right. Um, I think you all know each other, so you could just pass the mic to each other. And actually, Laura, just stay there in case these guys, if they're really quick, you could actually you know, have a question from someone else. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Doug Coppola from EarthTrack, and I had a question for Alice there. Um, one of the ways that we can kind of get a window on what people's expectations are is through the vertical rates. And I'm wondering if through your G or their customers, you've seen an increase in the hurdle rates for remote projects, mega projects, or in some of the areas with high carbon? Hi, Steve Kretzman, Oil Change International. Uh, question, well, really for both of you, I think this is a really, really important panel and sort of the heart of what we're all discussing here for these two days. Um, on the question, on the idea that oil and gas companies invest to meet expected demand, as Alistair said, and that, and that uh, you, you try to meet demand, I think there's a little uh, willful not looking at the fact that there's an awful lot of effort that goes into managing and manipulating demand expectations by oil and gas companies. If you read Steve Cole, who is the dean of the Columbia uh, School of Journalism's book, he talks about how the idea of Exxon's projections came out of their PR department in the early 2000s, and we see a consistent you know, the, the projections of demand coming from IEA, from EIA, and from major oil companies are all A, very consistently high and more or less congruent, and B, consistently wrong, specifically on the uptake of renewables. 
um, and how that has, you know, really beaten everybody's expectations, ex except I want to green pieces. So I, you know, I think that there is uh, there's something there um, about how uh, the demand gets uh, really. It's, there's a manipulation going on, in my humble opinion. The second thing is a question for Christoph, which is, I mean, 450 does not is not a two degree scenario. I don't know any current climate science that thinks that. Michael Mann thinks for, uh, that two degrees is 405 or 410 at the moment, and it seems to be moving consistently down from there. So. You know, when we, on the supply side, when we're trying to look at this, we sort of strip out the demand expectations, strip out the emissions side of it, and just say there's enough carbon that's in the current proven reserves that are currently operating to blow through the IPCC carbon budget. And that is just, that's not a projection, that's just a simple addition and comparison. And it's not, you know, as a policy point, it's very, very important for policymakers to consider that. That's different than thinking about how you manage that transition. And there's questions on the on the management side about whether or not market mechanisms are the most effective there. But just looking at the, the carbon that is in current embedded reserves is certainly a relevant point for this discussion. Great. If the next two could be quick questions, please. I'll be very quick. Uh, Christoph, could you give us a date for when you might stop assuming CCS will get invented? <laughs> <laughs> and friends last, and I'm sorry, Laura, we're going over time. So. Uh, yeah. Um, I know, I know. I know. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try not to be repetitive, but I think it's worth, worth maybe asking you a different way, is um, the tension here, I, I keep in these questions is, is it, you know, are, are, is the industry, you know, a, a passive actor in a, in, a, in a market system that it has no ability or intention to influence? Uh, and I, I think that sometimes the question's phrased the wrong way, so I'm going to ask it a little differently, is, isn't it a rational investment from major companies that have a lot of assets to try to influence policymakers? And aren't, isn't it a rational decision by individual actors um, in a policy, uh, an ambiguous policy scenario, and we're talking about 30 or 50 year projections, to make decisions that when you, when you aggregate the industry might seem irrational, but for the individual actor, I'm thinking of you know, Australia or an individual company, to behave in a way that that doesn't seem rational if you assume two degrees, but it certainly is rational if they're trying to avoid having to assume two degrees. Great, thank you. If I can give you each a minute and a half to respond um, to whichever questions or combinations of questions you would like to, um, and then we're going to move to the next panel. Good, I'll try and keep it quick. Um, first question, hurdle rates. Look, I, hurdle rates are kept very proprietary to, to companies, so our, our customers don't share their hurdle rates with us, so I'm not sure I can say that I've seen an increase in hurdle rates. What I'd say is in the current in current climate, um, not many people are taking forward final investment decisions for anything which is at all risky, remote, has technology risk or whatever, because it would just be career limiting. I mean, far better to, to wait and see what happens. Anything that goes through at the moment is going to be fairly standard, I think. Um, Look, a whole bunch of questions about um, influence of oil and gas companies on, on policy and on demand. I would say, look, I, I take the point about um, the views are being put out. Equally, I would say companies are not going to invest to meet demand that they do not believe will be there um, just because they've said it's going to be there. I mean, that would be crazy. From uh, their, their shareholders would kill them. Now. If you believe that putting out those those views will influence expectations enough for the entire system to adjust, then fine, that becomes, yes, it does become economically rational. I, I just don't believe there are enough you know, people out there making forecasts. I don't believe that a bunch of views from Exxon or BP or whatever can shift expectations of demand for an entire industry from something that you can work out through looking at economic growth rates, technology adoption, electric vehicle penetrations, etc. Um, and increase it by one or two points. I just, you know, there's enough other people in the world who will counter it. I just don't think that would be true. Uh, 
Um, sorry, can we yeah. go to Christoph? Because okay. I want to give him a minute to respond. Um, and we've got to so, go very quickly, whether the 450 scenario is a two degree scenario, it is a two degree scenario, it's a 50% chance of two degrees. And this year we'll be explicitly tying it to a, to a carbon budget. Um, so, it, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at it, so it definitely is. Um, the, uh, whether CCS will be invented, or I, I, I presume the question is not whether it will be invented, given it has been invented and has been de deployed. The question is more when, whether it will be deployable on a commercially viable basis. Um, I don't know when, when we, we update our scenarios whenever there is sufficient information to, to adjust an, an existing assumption. And as I say, this year, CCS has is, is, is not come through in the way people hoped. And maybe there will be, with some of the new projects that are planned around the world, they'll be shown that it can be deployed commercially uh, in a commercially uh, viable way. And then we will update our, uh, our scenarios. If they're not shown not to be commercially viable, then again we'll update our scenarios. The purpose in the scenarios is to, is to come up with a, a reasonable assumption, which is transparent to the extent that we can do, um, to, to say what, what is a reasonable expectation for how, how demand might go in the future. Um, whether the IA, a, IEA has consistently been wrong on, on renewables, this is an issue that was raised yesterday as well. And um, the, the way in which our, our scenarios are created is that we, in the central scenario, the new policy scenario, we take into account the policies which have already been announced and have uh, not, well, both which have been implemented and which have been announced. And over time, we've seen that those po the, the policies for renewables have ramped up over time. And as a result, the renewables deployment in our scenarios have also ramped up over time. So we haven't underestimated in any sense what's happened. We just, ref the scenarios just reflect what policymakers have claimed to, to do. And it's a very good thing that they ramp, they've been consistently ramped up because it shows that policy ambitions have, have been steadily increasing. Um, very, very quickly then on whether oil and gas companies can manipulate um, demand going forward. I, 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 I doubt they can really. I mean, they could, people put out these, these scenarios. The IEA, um, our study at UCL, we, 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 we try and make our, our assumptions and as much of the, our work as transparent as possible. The same is not necessarily true for all scenarios that you see, but you can always question all of the assumptions in, in, the, in the publicly available um, scenarios, and they're the ones which I would, I would encourage people to rely on more so than, than those from, from ones which are perhaps less transparent. Great. Thank you both so much.